Hello, everyone, and welcome to At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Meredith Whitney, who is the head of a new company, the Meredith Whitney Advisory Group, a Wall Street analyst and an entrepreneur. Meredith, welcome and nice to see you. Great to see you. So we'll talk all about your new company, but first I have to ask you about the banks. You famously predicted that banks would run into trouble in 2007. So I'm wondering, Meredith, what your take on our banking system now is. It's very different from 2007, 2008, and I'm not the first person to say that. That was very much a credit issue, and this is a funding issue. And a really, it's a, I think it's bigger than that. It's a faith issue, right? Ultimately, the financial system in the United States is a faith-based system. And when you lose faith in that system, it's not a good thing. All hell breaks loose. Um, and I look at the banks that have gotten into trouble, and particularly SVB, um, First, Repu First Republic, but SVB in, in particular, um, unforced error. It did not have to ha have to happen. I've been a counterparty to SVB as a CFO of couple, a couple startups, and I, I thought the bank was fantastic. Really bright people. Um, they required you to keep all of your deposits, all of your funding um, in deposits at the bank. And they should have known as, you know, 2001 was an incredible year for liquidity. You could raise money as a VC. You could also have exits. So there was a lot of money in the bank in 2021. In 2022, that was a different year for capital raising. And so deposits were shrinking. They should have shrunk their assets. And, all, and also there was no um, asset liability management, no asset management, there were no hedges. Um, it was just, to me, it was smart people being stupid and an unforced error because that was an absolute asset for Silicon Valley and, some, and the VC industry. Um, and it's frustrating because they didn't pull on any of the resources they could have pulled on. Um, and you go down the, the, the food chain, there are, you know, every bank is not created equal and there's some very poorly managed bank. Banks. I don't know that anyone would tell you that Signature was some fantastic bank that failed. Um, that was never really an A-plus bank. Um, but in terms of looking at the banks today, what's interesting is if you look at the daily short activity, you don't see daily short activity in any one bank specifically. It's all in the KRE, the banking and the regional bank index. And so people think that there's no reason to own the banks and they'll probably go down, right? Because there's no buying power. So most long onlys have sold out of the regional banks. Uh, but, and so there's no one to, to provide uh, buying support for those. But there's actually not a lot of short activity in single names like there was in 2007, 2008. So it sounds like you're saying these are sort of more one-offs that kind of hit the wall in a, a rate increasing, you know, a period of rates going up. Yeah. So you could see, like, I, I'm. People knew that the Fed was look. People got very lazy during a very long period of zero interest rate policy. Very lazy. But it was well telegraphed the Fed was going to start to raise rates, and so you should have been prepared. And um, for example, if you listen to Bank of America's first quarter conference call, effectively they said, um, you know, they were so well hedged they could liquefy and turn their hedges into cash at any moment. Like there are banks, now, surely they have a hundred people managing their hedging portfolio, but there are other resources in the system that regional banks and large regional banks could access, and they didn't. And that's just bad management. I'm not saying that this is the end of bank failures. They, there will, the odds are that there will be more, but it doesn't mean that you can point to one and know with surety that that's going to happen. It, does, it also doesn't mean it's systemic because it's not. Do you think there are remedies, reforms that need to be put into place? I do. Um, I think that um, things have to change in terms of if you look at how the banks have been regulated and the evolution of how bank banks have been regulated since 07, 08, um, it was ham-fisted. So there was so much over-regulation, and then it became um, kind of check-the-box regulation. So it wasn't dynamic. And like anything, any thinking, any regulation has to be dynamic. Now, the regulators in D.C., are not, now I'm not talking about the Treasury, but for the most part, most of DC is work remote. And there's not a lot of dynamic thinking when you are zooming in, right? Are you on mute or, you know, all the, all the, you know, 
things that SNL jokes about on uh, on on uh, Zoom calls. Um, so I think that uh, in many ways um, it needs to be a collaborative, dynamic system. And by that I mean. Um, the regulators have to appreciate that the smaller regional banks may be understaffed and may have to provide a blanket policy for how they are supposed to handle these situations. And raising the deposit limit, I don't think necessarily is the be all end all, right? The the majority of the deposit system is insured. And mm -hmm. it's not as if, I mean, in, in, in SVB and in First Republic situation, they had a lot of uninsured deposits because they had a lot of very wealthy clients. The average deposit is much smaller and under the threshold. What is it? Seven trillion of um, is uninsured in the system, and Powell thinks that one trillion may move. Um, the adage goes: people change their spouses more than they change their financial institutions. So it's going to take a lot. Um, but that gets back to faith. I think the regulators have to act um, as positive influences in the banking in, uh, um, industry and actually listen to the bankers and what they need. I think there will be a lot of structural change within the banking system. There's going to be a ton of M&A and there's going to be, I think, the big banks getting streamlining, getting smaller from non-core assets and the smaller banks getting bigger. You mentioned Fed Chair Jay Powell. What do you think of how he's performed over the past several years and his policies? Um, I don't think it's his blame alone, but I think the Fed policies were very late to raise rates. I mean, there's no question about that. Um, and in the face of so much fiscal spending, they were still keeping rates at near zero. I mean, that that, that math doesn't work, and they're a math-based institution. So uh, I appreciate the fact that he's very clear when he speaks, and that's very different from how I grew up with Greenspan, right? Um, but Greenspeak. Greenspeak. Um, but I um, I think they they were very late to the game, and here this is what we this is what we have. There's a clear consequence to them not raising rates sooner. So tell us about your new company and what the conceit is behind it. Okay, so this is an old company. So when I went on my own in 2009, I've always been an analyst, and I've always loved. I've always loved research. I've always loved digging into things and breaking things down and then trying to translate them to investors. And so I have done it my entire career. Around 2000, um, 2013, 14, after all the regulatory change had happened, after we had already gone to zero interest rate policy, after the banks had pretty much recapitalized their very weak balance sheets through QE, um, the industry got really boring to me. And I did a number of really cool things, I thought, that actually were before their time in terms of trying to create a um, large regional bank out of larger institutions, um, non-core assets. Um, and that probably, that, that idea will be adopted today. 10 years ago, 12 years ago, it was too early. That's sort of story of my life. Um, but the reason why I stopped writing was because writing on banks was like watching paint dirt, uh, you know, paint dry, and maybe less exciting. And um, I'd never wanted to be a maintenance analyst. I've always um, loved big ideas and fitting companies into them. And until it wasn't until about 18 months ago that I thought that things were changing and that I thought things were really interesting. And now I'm actually really excited to write again. So I'm just resurrecting what I started in 2009. So it's going to be research, but not necessarily for institutions, that's my understanding, but it's for retail investors as well? Yes. Yeah, so what's changed since I wrote? So I had, um, I look back at when I started my firm, and maybe I was just too dumb to appreciate how scary it was, because it was an enormous, uh, enormous expense and enormous undertaking to set up your own firm then. I mean, this is when you had to have big New York office space. This is when we were still on servers. You had big tech overhead. Um, and the expenses were so much higher. Today, you go from local to remote. You go from server to cloud. And the expense structure has declined dramatically. So my prices, which started at started at 100000 per year and went up from there, were limited institutional uh, clients and sovereign wealth funds were pretty much the only people that could afford. And 
people, you know, I have lists and lists of people who would call the office and try to get the research, and I couldn't provide it because I couldn't, I couldn't charge one person one thing and another person another. Today, the the price structure can be so much more approachable because the cost of goods sold is so much more reasonable. And I've always wanted to reach Main Street. I've always written a way that a way that could reach Main Street. And so high net worth clients and um, and financial advisors and retail investors, uh, retail advisors are really that's where I want to go first. I will. Um, I will have. I just saw an institutional uh, uh, client uh, before uh, before seeing you, and I will still have institutional clients. But I I'm most excited, and I will spend most of my time. I'll have a limited number of institutional clients. The bulk of my time is going to be to reach a larger audience, which I'm really excited about. All right. So, what are some trends? What are some things you're interested in right now, Meredith? I think um, one big thing is how the financial industry is going to restructure, and I call it slimline. So if uh, if you look at the major consolidated industry of the 80s, which was industrials, that effectively went through so many changes and slimlined through the 2000s, 2010s, um, it consolidated through 80s and 90s. And I think the financial institutions will go through similar um, similar periods. When I started in the industry, there were monoline businesses that were incredibly profitable. There were smaller institutions that were incredibly profitable. You just didn't have these big, clunky conglomerates. And this is very different from the break up the banks because they're too big to fail. This is everybody has to become and justify a profitable business model. So that's a long-term focus that I'm um, that I'm excited to um, participate in and uh, write about. And the other, uh, another trend I think is very interesting is um, all of the different vantages that you can operate on and invest upon on Gen Z and, and this, the second half of millennials, which the industry, the media industry pens, pens, pays a ton of attention to. Um, they don't have money. They're overemployed, working multiple jobs. Um, so they're spending what they earn. How are they going to become homeowners? And what is going to be attractive in terms of how that demographic has spending power, has um, durability as a consumer, and then how are they going to create wealth? Because the, the, the classic creator of wealth in the United States has been homeownership. And they are not homeowners. And they are basically boxed out of the housing industry because they don't have the affordability to make a down payment and to um, and to actually uh, uh, service a mortgage in a higher rate environment. So I think all of the layers that play into it, how can you create a finance model that makes catering to that, that demographic, Gen Z and second half of millennial, profitable? how you can cater to the folks that have all the money, which are Gen Xers and, and, um, and boomers, um, and then how the economy works around that. I know, I know that's a lot to deal with, but if you break, break things down in ter- terms of economic strength and break down the fragility of the lower half of the, the population, which is fragile and is going to have to be um, uh, cat- have to have to be banked and catered to in a very different way. They're not. A, it's not a credit generation. Um, two generations, um, and so they're. It's gonna. It's difficult to underwrite. FICOs are not the typical standard of FICO scoring. Is not going to be relevant. There's a lot of rich stuff here that I can write about for years. That I can dig my teeth into, and I'm excited about. It sounds like a problem and an opportunity kind yes, of thing. Yes, exactly. Right? Interesting. Let's talk about some of the trends you identified in your career municipals and states, you talked about problems there. Some people say, well, a lot of those problems really happened, but you seem to think that some of those things have been persistent, right? Well, to go back to why I got into the states in the first place, um, I didn't have any municipal bond clients. That was never an area that I thought I would focus on. But as I, when I said the banks were getting boring, I had so much data on the consumer in terms of consumer spend, where the consumer was over levered in the United States the sand states, remember Arizona, Nevada, Florida, California, and where there could be growth and where there couldn't be uh, growth. And so I, d- I, I dug deeper into that. And then I looked at how bad states had managed their own finances. And that effectively became double leverage because the individual 
taxpayer was levered, but the state was also levered. And what I found that was so upsetting to me was that the only things within the state's um, uh, constitution, constitutions that are guaranteed are the bonds, the municipal bonds, and the pensions. Discretionary money, which pays for schools, public safety, roads, um, uh, you know, uh, libraries, all of the things that we as taxpayers think that our tax dollars are going to is discretionary. And those are the areas that get cut the fastest. And so what happens then, the state has to raise taxes or cut uh, spending even further. And so there would be, de I, I said there would be defaults. And what I meant was, most importantly, social defaults. I called my first paper, Tragedy of the Commons, when so much of the resources in a town are eaten that there's nothing left for the people most in need. And that clearly has happened. And so what I, what I, I focused on was uh, state arbitrage, where people with means would, meet, would move um, because the states had managed their finances well and because there would be a lower tax burden, there would be better social services, um, and then what would happen uh, to the remaining st the states that the people left behind, lower tax dollars and a, a lower financial profile for bonds, by the way, and for social services. And that's all played out. I, I did not see COVID in my horizon when I did that. I did the, the research back in 2010. I published my book in 2013. Um, and uh, it absolutely has borne out in terms of you see so much migration coming from the New York area to Florida to Texas, California, from uh, California to Texas. And the Texas and Florida economies are booming. And right. what is left behind, California, New York, New Jersey, in real pickles financially. And um, what is so sad is public safety has suffered, social services have suffered, um, and the people most in need are going to suffer. So that's a moral claim. And by the way, like uh, the, the lowest priority in terms of my focus was the municipal bond holders getting paid. My first priority, I, I did this, and by the way, I self-financed all of this research, was basically a public servant announcement. Like here, the, here's the data. None of that data was provided in a concise fashion. And thankfully, the technology has changed, so you could probably get it a lot faster. All of it was manual when I did it. And so I did it, and I, um, and I wrote about it to raise focus on what you could do. And, and also, with that analysis and research that I did, I provided a solution guidebook for the states in terms of what they could do, which was the states are huge owners of assets that they don't need. So you could have a lot of public-private partnerships that would fund a lot of the gaps in the budgets. Um, but it fell on deaf ears. And um, because I my nose is always so in the books, mm -hmm. I didn't think about if I had a target on my back because of you know being early on the financial crisis. I didn't think about, you know, I, I, I thought surely people would just want the information, not be up in arms because I said that everybody would be at risk, including the municipal bondholders. Right. Well, I, mean, I, I think to your point, a lot of this stuff has been borne out, sadly, for some of these states. Yeah. You look at the homeless populations that are just exploding, yeah. and uh, it's, it's a real tragedy. Final question, Meredith, and I guess people maybe ask you this all the time, but how did you see the problems in 2008 coming in 2007? I started working on, uh, so I get a bug in my head, and then I'll just work it and work it and work it. And so in 2005, when everything looked hunky-dory, I wrote a piece that um, there would be a 10 there would be a risk of a uh, credit crisis with 10 percent of the population, and the 10 percent of the population was the group of people who became homeowners between 94, a part of the group of people who became homeowners between 94 and 2007, 2008, because the homeownership rate went from 64% up to almost 70%. And equity values in those homes dropped from what was nearly 70, 80% down to the 40%. So people were putting very little money down and getting in by the skin of their teeth and the underwriting wasn't great. 2005. But I didn't really move on that until December 2008. What I did in October, end of October, early 2000, uh, early November 2008, sorry, sorry, seven, excuse me. I didn't move on until December yeah, 2007, 2007, excuse me, um, was um, 
uh, during me focusing on housing um, and seeing what was going on in subprime, City had a new CFO, a friend of ours, Gary Crittenden, who I loved at American Express. And they had an event for City go and have drinks with the new CFO at um, at City. And I was like, last time I checked, Gary was Mormon and he doesn't drink, but okay. So it ended up turning into like an analyst uh, uh, meeting. and. Um, one of the best analysts at the time at Alliance Bernstein was like, I've given up re uh, modeling city. This, you know, it's just too complicated for me. And I was like, that's bad because that's your job. So I went back to the office. I was like, how do I simplify this? They've restated numbers so many times. How do I simplify this? And I, I worked hard at simplifying what had gone on. And, um, and I wrote that, I wrote that report a month before I published it and made sure it was absolutely right. And then I, then I waited till after the Fed meet, uh, met at the end of the month and published it the night of, um, of, uh, of Halloween um, 2007. And that, I think that lit the world on fire. And then people started paying attention to what I was writing on housing. And then I also focused on um, the fact that the rating agencies um, were responsible for what the <laughs> what was required in terms of the capital that banks had to hold on their balance sheet. And because the rating agencies were so far behind on um, updating their ratings on all these CDO products, the banks were just so underfunded. So I spent the next year writing on that. So it's just, um, you never know when something's going to be really important, but you know that it's going to be important and you keep gnawing away at it. And who knew that city would flip the switch for all the other stuff I was doing. But, you know, if anyone said I was a one hit wonder, they weren't paying attention to everything else I was doing. And then why I was able to get so much of 2007, 2008, and why I'm able to get today, because it's all about wealth creation and wealth destruction and flow of funds um, when you analyze stocks, at least financial stocks. And sort of you and the big short guys were in the wilderness early days there, and you certainly called that one. And look forward to the things that you're gonna be calling next. Meredith Whitney, CEO of the Meredith Whitney Advisory Group, thank you so much for Thanks joining us. Thanks so much, us. Andy. You've been watching At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.